please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we come charging into Easter morning and we're shouting hallelujahs and we're singing all full of triumph and confidence. Hymns like, Jesus Christ is risen today, alleluia. Right? We're singing these songs that rock it out, <laughs> that celebrate uh, this joy that we have in resurrection. But guys, let's not forget that on that original Easter, the words coming out of the disciples' mouths uh, did not sound like that, all full of triumph and confidence. It probably, in fact, sounded more like, Jesus H. Christ, he's risen, no way! I need an Advil. <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus sprung upon the world completely unexpected. Nobody saw it coming. And you see, the thing is, the disciples should have. Mark is abundantly clear about that, in fact. You see, Mark tells his story of Jesus with such economy that anytime you find a repetition in Mark, you better believe Jesus is like drilling this into them. And so it tells us in Mark 8, Mark 9, and Mark 10 that... Jesus told his disciples, I'm going to be handed over. I will be crucified and die. And on the third day, I will rise. I will rise on the third day. I will rise on the third day. I will rise on the third day. Got it? <laughs> and they didn't. You would have expected at least one male disciple who had been told these things to show up at the tomb and at the very least go like, what the heck? What could it hurt? I might see something amazing. We don't even get that. They're cowering in a room and they have, they have absolutely no hope, absolutely no idea of what is unfolding. You know, and, and to take it a step further, you know, here are these women, and this is another threefold repetition in Mark. These women are referenced. Uh, it's like they're being cited uh, as the people who've got the story. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph and Salome. These ladies are being cited as like, guys, if you don't buy this story that I'm telling you, you go get it from the horse's mouth. You go talk to the Marys and Salome and they'll tell you what's what. Because after all, they were there. They were there at the foot of the cross as Jesus bled and died there, was crucified. They were there as the tomb was sealed and that corpse was laid in there. And they were there on Sunday morning when the stone had been rolled away and no corpse remained. They'll tell you what's what. You see, I think sometimes as we approach this Easter story or some of these other things of God that are of grand stature and significance, we struggle with it. It's a bit unbelievable, right? If the resurrection is a bit unpalatable to you, it doesn't sit well, it isn't easily digested for you, then know that you're in good company because the first disciples, they struggled to comprehend it too. You see, sometimes we imagine for ourselves that the world was way different back then and that people then were so much more gullible or something within their train of thought uh, could have, you know, uh, made them more predisposed to believe that somebody could rise from the dead. But that's just simply not the case. Here's the thing. From a Jewish perspective, hope of resurrection was all about Everybody all at once rising at the end of all time and the world being set to rights. That's it. This whole concept of one guy being raised from the dead before everybody else completely not seeing that coming. 
On the other hand, you got the Greek perspective, and that's really, if there's any hope beyond this life, it is this, that your soul escapes from this hellhole of a planet, and it is detached. And it is free of the harm and the ill that we experience in this life here and now. Greeks believed in a, an eternity of the soul, and so a resurrection of the body, that somebody would rise from the dead and be visibly, really present on this earth, showing himself. They just didn't see it coming. It sprung on the world unexpected, and it came on the testimony of women. Now, see, the thing is, we don't necessarily uh, get the significance of the fact that this came from the testimony of women. Women's testimony was not held up in the court of law. It wasn't valid to verify a truth, okay? And so uh, women were not respected uh, as in our day. There was no sense of gender equality going on, okay? Uh, and actually, this is one of the, the earliest and strongest arguments against Christianity, Self a Greek philosopher in the second century AD said something like this. The resurrection of Jesus is a hoax. It is, you know, you can't rely on it because it is all based on the testimony of women and we all know that women are hysterical. <laughs> I mean, that's what he did. And it's like the room's hushed and like, well, it must not be true. That's all it took. <laughs> Do you get the point? If you're trying to fabricate a story about something happening, you don't have key leaders in a movement looking like jerks, like they don't know what's going on, and you don't have the testimony happening on the basis of women who see this. It just wouldn't sit well. So why do we have the stories as we do? Maybe, just maybe. Because they're just told as it unfolded as even they were struggling to comprehend with what just happened. You see, this story, it ends kind of abruptly. It ends with the women leaving the tomb bewildered and trembling and afraid and not speaking to anyone. It's this sort of cliffhanger thing going on. It's like the to be continued sort of sense to thing. There's like, there's like an ellipsis at the end of this story. Now, the beginning of the story, it started the beginning of the good news, the gospel of Jesus, who is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. It started out that way, the beginning of when that good news was spreading. And it ends at this cliffhanger note. And what it does, guys... It's like God's standing here and he's inviting you into this story to come face to face with the truth of the resurrection and go, what difference does it make in my life today? You come face to face with it and you also look at the scope of what's unfolded because you see, on the day that Jesus died, uh, you know, his little movement, I mean, it was small, Least likely to posthumously succeed, okay? Very small. It was like a little earthquake, and yet the tremor got bigger and bigger. 500 years, it's shaking much greater. A thousand years, it's spread across Europe. 2,000 years, it's covered the whole planet, and believers from all over the place are calling on the name of Jesus in their tongue. They're calling him Lord. And by the way, along the way, a lot of the testimony that carried it forward, a lot of the storytelling that kind of laid the groundwork for this movement was people who lost their lives with the conviction that it was true. What changed if they looked like jerks and like they didn't know what happened to then dying for this truth? crazy. You believe the witness who's willing to die for what he says is true. 
So here we are today, 2,000 years after the fact, and you know, not a whole lot has changed. We're still struggling to comprehend this earth-shattering significance of the game changer of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And the story's been told to us, and it's kind of like it's left with, well, if you don't believe my story, go talk to Helen. Go talk to Annie. Go talk to June. They'll tell you what's what. <laughs> They'll tell you about Jesus. You see, in our day and age, um, Jesus' name is thrown around in all sorts of ways. Um, and there are a lot of misunderstandings about who he is and his significance and all this kind of stuff. We're still struggling to comprehend, you know, who this guy is and, and what he's done and what significance it is in our lives today. Sometimes his name's thrown around real flippantly. And, and it's like, uh, you know, uh, we're working uh, in the shop or something like that, throw a hammer the wrong way and it strikes the thumb. And it's like, you get to be the pious, the most pious person around. I mean, you're, you're talking Jesus all over the place. <laughs> Jesus H. Christ, you know? Christ isn't his last name, by the way. Just so you know. <laughs> Christ is his title. Christ is tells us about who he is and how his reality connects with ours. It's a very specific title that accomplishes a very specific thing, and it goes something like this. This is what you need to carry with you. See, it says, what's true of the king is true of his people. And so if Jesus is your Christ, your Lord, then what's true of him is true of you. This is an ancient Israelite concept, and it goes back to King David. It's like he slayed the giant Goliath with, you know, just five smooth stones. He felled that guy. And that wasn't just a victory for David over Goliath. It was a victory for Israel over the Philistines. So when Jesus rose from the grave, it's not just his victory over death. It's our victory over death and sin and the devil and every single force of evil on the face of this planet that still rears its ugly head in our lives. It was the death knell, the, the game over declaration as Jesus rose from the dead. Death has met its match. And what's true of the king is true of his people. I think we need to uh, realize this and come to terms with this in a new way, uh, in a memorable way, and uh, I think we need the opportunity to uh, act like children uh, a little bit, okay? So I invite you to stand right now, okay? Here's the thing. You didn't know this was interactive, did you? <laughs> I didn't sign on for this. <laughs> Our story connects with his it intersects in amazing ways, okay? So I'm gonna go through a series of sayings and I'm gonna offer an explanation, but I'm gonna invite, invite you to echo what I say and what I do, okay? Each step of the way, we're gonna learn this thing. We're gonna tell the story, okay? So the first stretch of it says, I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Yeah, don't poke anybody's eye out, all right? Seriously, uh, but let, let's try this again, okay? Uh, I'm not convinced yet. I have been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. So here's the thing. Jesus died on the cross. The corpse was laid in the tomb, and there was no corpse any longer. We have been crucified with him through daily repentance. The old stuff in us, the old habits that die hard, they're gone, removed, never seen again. That's forgiveness, guys. I have been crucified with Christ. Okay. There you go. Hey, how about it? All right, good. You're ready to repeat. You get the game. Okay, here we go. Uh, next stretch of this is I no longer live, and it's like you're just kind of letting your head down like really dead, okay? So here we go. I no longer live. Okay. So, uh, you know, self-explanatory on that one. Uh, but Christ lives. And so on this one, uh, you're raising your hand up like you're receiving this gift, this thing that's been accomplished for you 
that you didn't do and you're just ready to receive it. But Christ lives. Okay, let's try that again. But Christ lives. Okay, last stretch of the game. Uh, where does he live? In me, right? Yeah, he lives and reigns and he oversees the whole shebang, but see, he lives in me in a very special way. We are the temple of God to dwell by his Holy Spirit, all right? Um, he lives in me. And so the arms, they come down and they come down to your side. And one more move here. I'm going to add it on to the end because we've got to practice this. This is like the most important part, okay? So at the end, like you're bringing your arms down and at the end of this thing, you go, whoo! And you stare. I have the victory. There you go, right? Okay, so there's this, this certainty that's there. Um, so, uh, but Christ lives in me, and this is like proclaiming victory. It's like hard enough of a stomp to roll a stone away. It's like hard enough of a stomp to crush the serpent's head and end the fight, okay? Uh, it's like that kind of thing. Like this really means something for me today, right here, right now. So, let's do it. Repeat after me. In me. Huh. Okay, now, uh, I'm, still, uh, I'm still not convinced we've got to refine this thing, okay? So, uh, this is the joy that I get on Easter, okay? Um, having you do fun stuff like this, okay? So, here we go. Um, so, without the words up on the screen, we're just going to do it in sync with me. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. <laughs> One more time. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. One more time, guys. Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. See, the thing is, you got to be able to do this when I'm not around, though. So, um, so this time, I'm not going to lead the charge. I'm going to uh, film you guys. How's that? Okay? So, here we go. All right. So, here we go. Take it away. I. Brilliant. <laughs> you guys sit down. <laughs> All right. Man. Got to get charged up on Easter Sunday. Just to be reminded that this is really game changers. <laughs> you see, Paul tells us about the importance <laughs> of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Not only there, but other places. 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about, you know, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And he rolls out this whole grand story of resurrection that like the stuff that went wrong with the world in Adam, it was undone in Jesus, who's the second Adam, who rose from the dead before everybody else. And then therefore, that there's going to be this massive resurrection of all those who follow him, all those who claim him as Lord, who name him as Savior, who he is their Christ at the end of time when he returns. So he lays out this whole grand thing. It's like all highfalutin and like we have trouble grasping that too. And at the end of that thing, it's like a big ellipsis. Dot, dot, dot. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. See, it's all well and good that we charge in here all high and mighty and we sing our praises and we're into it on Easter Sunday and it's as if we're believing strongly in the resurrection, but let's face it, guys, there are days when we don't feel it. When life doesn't seem like it's all chock full of resurrection hope and purpose and significance. Can we be real about that? <laughs> Absolutely. And so here's the thing. It's there. It's true, even though you don't always feel it. Your life has significance and worth and purpose even when you fail to see the clarity about it. We are beginning a journey here at Prince of Peace 
starting next week, uh, a worship series called Living on Purpose. Um, and it's inspired by a book and a study series called Chazon, okay? And you gotta, if you're saying Chazon, you gotta like spit, so sorry. Um, Chazon, right? Okay, sorry, Terry. Um, but uh, here's the thing. The whole series is about finding your purpose, rediscovering that resurrection hope in your life. It's about gaining clarity because while you may not feel it or know it on a daily basis, God's got it in hand. He has the plan. And so uh, you go through a specific kind of process individually and as groups to discover your spiritual gifts, to walk through your past experiences, uh, to do all these sorts of things to, to discover and take hold of these aspects of your life and sculpt them according to God's purposes and in prayer. So I invite you to come along in that journey. Lots of ways you can do it. Come to worship the next six weeks and we'll walk you through that. If you're not here, you can stream uh, the messages, the services uh, to kind of tap into the journey uh, from further away. If you are here, you can dig into it in a group setting. Our peace groups, many of them are doing uh, the study, and so uh, you can call the church office and see how you can get uh, connected in uh, to that. Diana Vanderpass is our director of group life, so she'd love to get you connected in. Uh, there will also be a study uh, on nine, at 9.30 on Sunday mornings uh, here on out for six weeks uh, in which you'll be able to explore that as well. If you want to do it on your own, then there's copies of the book you can find, uh, Kazon, okay? Uh, and that'll be good as well. So all that to say, guys, we're here on this Easter Sunday, and we're here standing right smack dab in an ellipsis. God's story continues in us. His resurrection joy resides in us. And now we're called to share the good news of the gospel that Jesus has risen. We're called to bring beauty to this dying and broken and decrepit world. We're called to bring justice where there's injustice. We're called to live as the body of the risen Christ. Let's do it one more time for good measure. Come on. Oh, you got it. I mean, you got it in hand by now. Come on. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Oh, Take a load off, guys. We now worship our God of love with our gifts of love, our offering.